So shall we start? It's five o'clock in Yerevan. Okay. 3 p.m. Central European time. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Victoria Raquel, Associate Editor of Iran and the Caucasus, published by Brill Leiden. And uh, I'm very happy we can continue now this uh, online series dedicated to uh, the 25th anniversary of Iran and the Caucasus. And uh, our today's speaker is Dr. Matteo Comparetti from Shanxi University. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matteo, for joining our project. We have a fascinating subject uh, today on the iconography of the Zoroastrian rain god Tishriya in the pre-Islamic Central Asian art. And uh, I'm giving the floor to Matteo. Thank you again. And uh, please enjoy, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much, Victoria and Garni Kazatriana, for this invitation. Uh, actually, um, we have some technical issues here, so I, you will hear me uh, repeating next the next slide because I cannot uh, present from my own uh, uh, laptop. Anyway, it's a very small uh, uh, detail. What I'm going to show you is uh, a very new, uh, very fresh. Uh, um, hypothesis uh, that I'm trying to develop, uh, recollecting all of the material uh, from uh, ancient uh, Zoroastrian uh, parts of a, of a Eurasian continent. And um, unfortunately, I will not be able to um, fully be convincing because uh, um, we have many gaps uh, in this uh, presentation, uh, I'm perfectly aware that uh, I don't have enough material, which is mainly uh, intuitive. Um, it's better if I start presenting and showing you some images, so you'll better understand what I mean. So, uh, Shushanik, please, uh, next uh, slide. We have to start, uh, first of all, uh, with some ge geographical setting because uh, uh, even though we are used to think about uh, uh, Persia or Iran as uh, the main Zoroastrian uh, uh, or Mazdian uh, kingdom or empire in the ancient world, actually, we know much better the situation from an archaeological point of view in the Caucasus and in Central Asia. So um, the map I'm presenting you, which is from uh, Michael Schenker book uh, about uh, Zoroastrian deities, uh, present uh, uh, much better from an archeological and art historical point of view, the situation that we have uh, on the Western and Eastern part uh, of the Iranian world. Even though the Caucasian kingdoms in those days uh, were not, uh, and even now are not exactly uh, Iranian uh, kingdoms, uh, uh, stricto sensu, but they were uh, deeply uh, influenced uh, by uh, Iranian culture and specifically Zoroastrianism. So next slide, please. I have tried to collect uh, all the material uh, concerning the god Tishtria, uh, the Avestan god Tishtria, uh, next slide, please. And uh, um, very recently, we had some uh, uh, Iranian excavations uh, in uh, uh, Iranian Azerbaijan. And uh, uh, at the site uh, of Kaleye Zahak, we have some very interesting stucco decorations. And according to the excavators, this figure that you can see in this slide would be possibly a, an image of uh, um, Tishtria, who was uh, connected probably in uh, Middle Persian uh, literature with uh, the god Tyr. Uh, can you show the slide uh, before, please, uh, Shushanik? Anyway, we have no inscription in this kind of uh, archaeological findings. The uh, idea of uh, Iranian archaeologists that this could be uh, Tishtria or Tyr 
practically the same deity, more or less, uh, is that uh, he has a weapon in his hand uh, which has been reconstructed as an arrow. So um, since uh, uh, very ancient time, uh, already in Mesopotamian culture, um, the god uh, Nabu, who was uh, uh, connected with uh, Iranian Tishtria, was uh, uh, conceived uh, as a deity represented by an arrow or a stylus, because he was the patron of scribes. And very interesting, uh, Antonio Panaino recently uh, found some uh, uh, Middle Persian texts where we have uh, some information about uh, Tishtria as the patron of scribes. So there is definitely a connection between these uh, two deities. But immediately we have a problem. We are talking about uh, um, findings. We are talking about uh, information coming from uh, very different places in time and space. Even though, of course, uh, uh, the Achaemenid Empire was deeply uh, in depth uh, with uh, Mesopotamian culture and especially the Neo Assyrian Empire. Uh, Sushanik, please, uh, next slide. I'm going to show you uh, every small piece of evidence that I was able to collect uh, about this uh, deity, uh, Tishtria, who in the Avesta is the rain god. So he is uh, an aquatic deity somehow who was superimposed probably during the Achaemenid period or probably earlier, we don't know exactly, with Mesopotamian Nabu. Anyway, during some excavations in Armenia, in Shirak region, in Anushavan, we had this kind of statuettes. And according to the excavators, this could be an image of Tyr, you know, uh, Armenians, Iberians, Iberians uh, and uh, Caucasian Albanians, uh, uh, even though they were not Iranian-speaking uh, people, they adopted the Zoroastrianism. So it could be possible that uh, they also represented this uh, deity, specifically Tishtria, Tyr. We know that uh, Agatangelos, for example, during the Christian uh, period, wrote about this deity. He wrote about Anahita, he wrote about uh, Ormazd, which is the Armenian form of Aura Mazda. But unfortunately, these statuettes do not present inscriptions. They have sometimes, but not in this specific case. So I'm afraid that uh, those scholars who consider this specific statuette as Tyr, Tishtria, uh, actually uh, said something arbitrary. We need uh, something uh, more solid, something more uh, precise, something written, for example, in order to be able to identify something like this uh, with uh, uh, Tyr. Uh, next uh, slide, please, uh, Shushanik. And again, uh, in Armenia, we have a, a very recent uh, book, uh, which is a compendium of uh, all uh, ancient uh, stele. And this one is considered by Grigor Grigorian, who published uh, the best book about this uh, object uh, from uh, Garnahovit. He considered this uh, stele, uh, which is destroyed in the upper part uh, and decorated on uh, all uh, the four sides, uh, and it should be dated to the first th third century uh, CE, which means pre Christian. We know, and I, I agree with uh, Gregorian, uh, that uh, some of this uh, stele, pre Christian in Armenia, means practically Zoroastrian. I think we more or less uh, can, uh, can agree on this point. And uh, probably the Christian Armenians recycled and reused this kind of objects. Now, uh, the reason why I'm showing you this uh, stele is that uh, on the left of your screen, you have reproduced the side with an arrow. 
since we know that uh, uh, Tishtria Tir uh, was uh, connected with the arrow, you know, this is also the name of planet Mercury. Uh, even the name of uh, the river Tigris uh, should be connected, or Tigran the Great, uh, the, the king of the Armenian kingdom, they all have, or Tiridates, uh, you know, the, the, the Arsacid uh, Armenian king who promoted Christianity in Armenia, they all are connected with this uh, deity who had some connection with uh, the arrow. However, again, uh, we don't have uh, 100% certainty about this uh, identification. So I think uh, uh, Gregorian could be uh, correct, but we need some more specific uh, elements in order to identify this stele with uh, uh, Tishtria. In some other um, Armenian stele, uh, maybe pre-Christian, definitely Christian period, uh, we have some arrows, but they are used simply as uh, decorative elements. That's why we have to be very careful when we uh, propose this kind of identifications. So next slide, please. That's the reason why we have to move to Central Asia, where uh, specifically in uh, Sogdiana, which is the historical region between the modern southern uh, Uzbekistan and uh, southwestern Tajikistan, we have this uh, Eastern Iranian civilization developed for uh, quite a long time, which has been investigated during the Soviet time and uh, still nowadays um, Uzbek, Tajik, Russian, uh, international teams uh, keep uh, uh, investigating this very interesting region. Uh, next slide, please. Already uh, in the 90s of the last century, uh, Marshak and Raspopova propose in this uh, reconstruction of very fragmentary paintings from Penjikent to identify uh, Nana and Tishtria. We can identify Nana in Central Asia very easily. However, we have to keep in mind that Nana was a very ancient uh, Sumero uh, Mesopotamian goddess who was accepted in Central Asia, especially in Sogdiana, Bactria, Khorasm, and she became the main deity uh, in pre-Islamic time in these lands. Now, um, we also know, uh, thanks to some uh, uh, Sogdian documents, that uh, definitely Nana was uh, one of the most popular deities in Sogdiana, but we also have the name Tish in Sogdian is uh, Tishtria, Avestan Tishtria. They correspond, uh, most of the linguists uh, agree uh, from this point of view. There are some discrepancies because we cannot be completely uh, sure, but uh, we have some good hints uh, to say that uh, they, they are uh, the same uh, entity. And uh, uh, many names uh, of Sogdian people mentioned in Sogdian documents have a part of a name, including the name of Tish. And uh, um, in the next slide, please, I wanted to focus uh, specifically on this uh, divine uh, couple. Marshak uh, proposed uh, to identify Tish uh, with uh, the god uh, on the right, uh, who is holding an arrow in his hands. And this is uh, exactly uh, the point, uh, I think. However, um, in this uh, reconstruction, because it's very fragmentary, we have uh, Nana sitting on her symbolic animal, with four hands, because we are in the eighth century, and the Indian elements started to be very uh, popular in uh, 8th century Sogdiana. At least since uh, the 6th century, Indian elements, especially uh, religious uh, iconography, started to become more and more important in Sogdiana. That's why Nana has four hands 
and she's usually holding the moon and the sun with the upper hands. The sun is usually, usually above the head of a lion. But what called my attention some years ago was uh, the throne or the support of uh, Tish, Tishtria. In fact, he's sitting definitely on a throne supported by dragons. And I think uh, uh, this is something very interesting uh, because uh, in, uh, we said that Nana is a Mesopotamian deity, no doubts. She was uh, taken from Mesopotamia somehow, sometime, we, we are not well informed about every uh, small detail, but definitely she's there. She's in Sogdiana, she's in Bactria, even in Kushan coins, uh, uh, second century uh, CE, we already have Nana with inscriptions in Bactrian mentioning her. And uh, in Mesopotamia, the husband of Nana was Tishtria, or uh, sorry, was Nabu. And Nabu was the god of scribes. We have some uh, evidence, according to Panaino, that uh, Tishtria too was. Uh, the uh, patron of scribes uh, in Sogdiana. So there was a kind of a superimposition between uh, these two deities, the Mesopotamian and uh, the Iranian. Practically, uh, Iranian people in Central Asia took Nana. We have uh, uh, Nana mentioned as Nane in uh, Christian period Armenian sources. She was proper, probably popular in uh, Parthian uh, uh, Persia. We have some uh, small uh, evidence about uh, Nana during the Sasanian period, but in Central Asia, she was uh, very much worshipped. And uh, in, um, in Central Asia, um, the husband of Nana, Nabu in Mesopotamia, started to be uh, Tishtria. Tishtria was identified with the star Sirius and the planet Mercury in the Iranian sphere. And this is something that we have to keep in mind in order to propose some uh, better identifications, in my opinion. So, um, if uh, uh, you look at the, the throne, you will see that definitely we have a very strange dragon with elongated uh, neck, with wings, there is probably another dragon on the helmet, on the crown of Tishtria. And uh, uh, this uh, called my attention. Uh, next slide, please. Because uh, Shushanik, can you, um, can you change the slide, please? OK, excellent. Uh, this is uh, a Neo-Assyrian uh, uh, seal or seal impression with an image of uh, Nabu. You know, Nabu was uh, a very important deity. He was uh, considered at a certain point uh, to be the son of Marduk. Marduk was the main god of Babylon. And that's the reason why um, Nabu started to be represented together with the symbolic animal of Marduk, which was the dragon, called Mushhushu in Akkadian. And you see that Nabu has this stylus in his hand, which could have been confused very easily with an arrow. Now, between you know, Mesopotamians and Iranians, we have also the Greeks, and the Greeks identified Nana with Artemis and Nabu with Apollo. And this is very interesting. Apollo was sometimes represented, he was an archer, you know, he was represented with an arrow in his hands. So I think that very cautiously and forced to move in space and time with very big gaps in between, we can probably start to see that there was some correspondence between these gods in Mesopotamia, in the Greek world, 
and we, in the Iranian world, which comprise, of course, uh, Persia, the Caucasus, and Central Asia. Now, um, uh, I, we have also to say that Tishtria in, uh, in uh, Iranian astrology and astronomy was uh, connected to uh, Sirius. Sirius uh, was uh, and is uh, the brightest star of uh, the constellation of Canis Major. Canis is Latin for dog. So we have to keep in mind that he was connected with dogs. So for the moment, we have two symbolic animals. One is the dog, but uh, only in theory, and one is the dragon. And we do have a correspondence between uh, ancient uh, Assyrian uh, uh, seals from Mesopotamia, many centuries earlier, and many centuries after, we have uh, uh, in eighth century, the paintings from Penjikent, uh, in, uh, in Eastern Sogdiana. So, uh, next slide, please. We have uh, uh, some very interesting objects uh, definitely connected with uh, death, with funerals uh, in Sogdiana, in pre-Islamic Central Asia, which is uh, ossuaries. So, terracotta ossuaries very often especially in during the 7th, 8th century, present uh, some very interesting decorations. And in this case, uh, we have something unique. We have uh, uh, arches, and uh, under these arches, we have again this uh, uh, divine couple. On the left, uh, we have Nana. Unfortunately, uh, the symbolic animals are not represented here. But we can identify Nana because she's holding the sun and the moon in the upper hands. Here, we have a very strong Indian element. You see that uh, both deities have four hands, but uh, the arches are coming from uh, uh, Roman Byzantine art. Sogdians like very much, they were extremely receptive with uh, other uh, cultures. They were in touch with um, Roman Byzantines. They were uh, connected with India. They had very strong cultural and uh, uh, trading uh, connections with China. And uh, sometimes we have these uh, different elements coming from everywhere else uh, to appear again. But what is very interesting is that we have to keep in mind that the Mesopotamian elements are very present here because Nana is definitely a Mesopotamian goddess. And uh, if you look carefully, the deity uh, sitting or dancing on the right with four hands is holding something circular in upper uh, uh, hands. But the lower hands, uh, they are holding an arrow. It's just doing like this. It's very similar to the way Apollo is holding the arrow in Seleucid coins. Okay? You know, Seleucids were controlling Mesopotamia and Iran. So, it's not that easy to put together all the elements. Once more, we have very big gaps. But as a result, we have something like this. Even though we don't have symbolic animals, we have something very similar to the painting from Penjikent that Marshak proposed to identify in the upper part with Nana and, uh, and Tish, Tishtria. In my opinion, even though we don't have the symbolic animals, we could imagine that the lion was very appropriate for Nana. She always had the lion since the Mesopotamian time, and the dragon was the animal of uh, Tishtria since Mesopotamian time. Uh, next slide, please. I want to show you uh, something else. We have sometimes uh, in uh, Sogdian art, uh, deities uh, sitting on a dragon. And in this case, we have something coming from Erkurgan. This is from Southern Sogdiana. Unfortunately, we have no inscription in this uh, 
a seal impression, but we have a deity approaching somebody who is offering, so a kind of donor, probably female. And uh, uh, in the hand of this uh, deity, there is an elongated object with something uh, hanging, something like uh, maybe a, a ribbon, which is very uh, normal in Sasanian and Sogdian art. And then we have uh, some uh, astrological, astronomical element behind the deity. And we know that uh, uh, Tish was connected in Iranian astrology, astronomy, which uh, they are practically put together in ancient times. They, there was no big difference. And uh, um, we know that Tish was connected with the star Sirius and the planet Mercury. Nabu in Mesopotamia was uh, the planet Mercury as well. So, and the Nabu had the dragon. So uh, this is just an idea, of course. Uh, and uh, again, uh, the chronology is not the same like uh, in uh, the ossuary I show you earlier, or the painting from Penjikent. So uh, since we know that the Sogdians uh, liked very much to experiment, we can imagine that this deity is not represented with four hands because Indian elements didn't start yet to be that important. Of course, it's just a very uh, risky uh, hypothesis. I don't have anything uh, epigraphic to show you 100% this is a tish. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to insist uh, because we have other images of uh, a god uh, sitting on uh, a dragon according to Sogdian style. Uh, Shushanik, can you uh, show next slide, please? Here we are. This is uh, a burnt uh, a wooden frieze from Penjikent, so probably 7th, 8th century. And under these uh, arc arches, exactly like uh, in, um, in the Sogdian Oshari I showed you before, we have uh, on the left uh, a god sitting on a chariot. You can see the wheel, you can see the horses. This is a typical image of Helios in, uh, in Greek art, uh, but is even Surya in India. And in Sogdiana, it could be Mithra. This was the proposal by Marshak and Franz Grenet. But what about the deity sitting on the right? If you look carefully, the deity is holding something, an elongated object in the right, uh, right hand. And uh, the throne is formed by the, the, the rear part of two animals. And there is a horn on the head of this animal. And this horn, it's uh, something very interesting because uh, we do have uh, something like this uh, on the dragon, the Mush Hushu, uh, that was uh, the symbolic animal of uh, Nabu in Mesopotamia. Now, of course, uh, I don't have much uh, um, iconographic material. I don't have much uh, written documents to, to state that this uh, uh, images uh, should be identified 100% with uh, Tish. But I would like to show you something else uh, in order to, um, to demonstrate something and to show as much as possible material in this direction. So uh, Shushanik, please, uh, next slide. So this uh, is uh, a reconstruction of uh, the main part of Penjikent. Penjikent is a Sogdian city miraculously uh, preserved uh, in, uh, in Western Tajikistan, only 60 kilometers from Samarkand. And uh, uh, in the more or less central part of Penjikent, we have this uh, so-called twin temples. So two temples uh, next to each other with some very interesting decorations around. And uh, the arrow is showing you some chapels where we have uh, uh, interesting material, mainly painted, that I would like to show you in the next slide, please. So this is uh, uh, the plan 
and uh, the arrow is showing you uh, the uh, rooms that we are going to consider. Uh, next slide, please. Here we are with uh, um, the ideas by Belenitsky and Marshak in Giti Azarpei book about uh, Sogdian paintings. Um, this is very detailed. Uh, next slide, please. I show you something a little bit uh, more simplified. So if you look uh, in the upper part, uh, in room number five, I try to highlight uh, uh, some fragmentary uh, paintings that we have uh, on uh, the uh, western part of this uh, room. And just in front, we have some other paintings much better preserved. And uh, according to Marshak, the very fragmentary uh, part uh, could be identified with Nana, because uh, we can identify uh, the lion, we can identify parts uh, of this deity who was sitting on the lion. So most likely we have Nana. Who is the deity we have in front of Nana in this room? I show you in the next slide, please. Here we are. So um, in the sketch on the right, uh, you can see the so-called white goddess. So according to the excavators and according to the scholars who studied these uh, paintings, this deity should be identified with a woman, okay? And uh, if you look carefully at the throne on the right side, in the lower part, you can see that there is a creature which is coming out. And uh, um, we don't have uh, big uh, Indian elements. The deity only has uh, two hands. We are here probably in the fifth century. And in the next slide, please, I want to call your attention on one detail. In the, uh, in the left hand, there is an object. Now I cannot see because I have a very small screen now, but you should be able to see that in the left hand, this deity is holding an elongated object with some square elements, a kind of, uh, um, how to say, uh, a procession of square elements, okay? Maybe precious stones or some other kind of decoration. And uh, I would like for the moment you to keep in mind that uh, uh, we have something, an object, probably a stick, the point of this stick in the hand of a deity is not preserved, but behind the hand you can see some ribbons hanging. So it's a stick with some ribbons attached to the top. And I think that uh, there, there could be something else on the top of this uh, object. But just keep in mind this detail. Now, next slide, please. I wanted to focus on the creature, on the winged creature, we have uh, coming out from one side of a throne. And this creature, for a very long time, has been considered by scholars to be a representation of Sanmurv in Middle Persian or Simurd in Persian. But uh, actually, this is most likely a winged dog. Okay? And what is very interesting in this uh, uh, winged dog uh, is the curly horn behind the ears. I hope you can see, I, I highlight uh, with uh, a small uh, blue arrow. And this uh, small uh, curly horn, I don't know how to call it, but uh, this is what it is, uh, always called my attention because uh, we have something like this, uh, in the dragon of Nabu. Next slide, please. You probably know this uh, creature from the Ishtar Gate uh, in Berlin. 
that this is coming from Babylon originally, and uh, it's uh, the symbolic animal of Marduk, the main god of ba Babylon. But uh, we know that uh, this creature was also the, the symbolic uh, uh, animal of uh, Nabu. And you see that there is uh, uh, like a very tall horn, and behind this horn, there is this uh, curly horn. So, of course, uh, I don't have enough evidence uh, to say that they are the same creature. <laughs> there were definitely transformations during the centuries, and we are moving thousands of kilometers uh, far away between Mesopotamia and Central Asia. So very big uh, time distance and very big geographical distance. But this curly horn, I think uh, it's something very important. And uh, uh, next slide, please. We have uh, in Bamiyan, which is not exactly part of uh, ancient Bactria, but uh, very close uh, to Bactria is nowadays in Afghanistan. And we have this image in a Buddhist context, we have this image of a so-called hunter king. You know, scholars, were, when they found this image, they could not decide if this was uh, a bodhisattva or a king. But uh, I have a third uh, option. This could be an astrological, astronomical representation of a planet, could be the personification precisely of Mercury. You see, there are arrows on the left uh, of this uh, uh, figure. There are some arrows on, uh, on the ground. And uh, uh, he is holding a bow with both hands just in front uh, of his neck. And there is a dog coming out from his throne. So we are not in Sogdiana here, but the artist uh, who did this painting, he definitely used uh, Sogdian elements. And in my opinion, we should not uh, consider only the possibility that this is a bodhisattva or uh, a nobleman, but uh, he could also be a personification of a planet. And precisely, in my opinion, this could be Mercury. Mercury, Nabu, Tishtria, they are connected with uh, Canis Major, the constellation where Sirius is, and Mercury. So we have to consider that in Bamiyan, above the head of the highest, higher Buddha, we have a representation of a sun god in a very uh, strongly uh, influenced Iranian style. Iranian, Indian, of course, this is a Buddhist site, so we have a very interesting mixture of uh, elements. But if we have the sun god uh, represented uh, in this uh, way, why not having some other planet? And the fact that we have a dog in this case uh, is telling us that here Iranian elements are much stronger than in uh, Sogdiana when we have the dragon. The dragon is Mesopotamian, reminding us of Nabu. But uh, the image of a so-called white goddess uh, in uh, Temple 2 in Penjikent uh, was a winged dog. That's the point. Uh, I think that the Sogdians uh, maybe at a certain point uh, try to mix uh, the Mesopotamian dragon with the Iranian dog. Nabu and Tishtria put together. Now, next slide, please. We have other paintings uh, uh, which are dated uh, to another period. So we are now in the very early uh, 7th century, around the year um, 600, probably. There is a niche in uh, this, uh, in the same room from where the paintings I, I showed you before are coming. And uh, in this niche, there is uh, this uh, image. Next slide, please. And uh, this image, uh, I think uh, it's uh, extremely interesting because once more, scholars identified uh, this deity sitting on a dragon as a woman. 
So the other one from the same room is called white goddess because of the garments, they are mainly white. But in this case, uh, the red color is prevalent. But in this case, uh, unfortunately, in both uh, images, we have no head. The head was practically destroyed. But we see, in this case, four hands and a very typical Indian dragon. Because now, in this period, Indian elements are very, very strong in Sogdiana. So this uh, dragon is a Makara, 100%. But if you look carefully in the left uh, upper hand, this uh, deity has uh, a long stick with uh, square elements and most likely the top uh, had some ribbons attached. So this detail, in my opinion, is suggesting us that this uh, deity sitting on a dragon is exactly the same one sitting on uh, the winged dog, which is a dragon practically, but uh, represented in two different periods according to different styles. But they are holding in one hand the attribute of a god. And in my opinion, this attribute is an arrow, which is the symbol of Tishtria, Tish in Sogdiana. And the next slide, please. This is the identification which I propose. We have uh, uh, Tish, Tishtria, with arrow sitting on a dragon. He has uh, four hands, so he is represented like uh, um, an Indian uh, deity. And then we have uh, a donor on, on the right. And behind the donor, we have more Sogdian deities. Uh, that uh, uh, Marshak already identified with Advag, which is Aura Mazda. He has uh, a music instrument in one hand, which is a lyre, and Vashagna, which is Verethragna, the god of war and victory of Avesta. And he is holding a severed human head. If you look uh, in uh, um, book uh, illustrated uh, astrological text uh, from the Islamic period, especially in Persia, you will see a lot of representation of the god Mars, actually the planet Mars uh, in Islamic time, with a human head in his hand. And in Sogdian art, uh, we already have this. We have to keep in mind that probably the astrological, astronomical element was always very important. And this is my, uh, how to say, way, the way of interpreting Sogdian deities, uh, which uh, I favor in this moment. So um, the identification of the excavators of room five uh, in the three chapels that we have in the northern part uh, in Temple Two in Penjikent. Uh, the, both deities uh, should not be identified with women. They, of, of course, they are dressed uh, in a way and they have a lot of jewels uh, which are suggesting as uh, women, but uh, um, most likely they had no beard, they had long hair, but uh, uh, garments, jewels, uh, no beard, clean shaved face and long hair, could be even for men, why not? I mean, Apollo <laughs> in Greece, uh, um, or even, uh, you know, Dionysus sometimes uh, had the hair like a woman. If he was not naked, Dionysus uh, very often could be confused with an parade of the Dionysian uh, um, orgiastic uh, parade. So, I think that we have to keep in mind all these elements in order to have some uh, uh, new identification. If we keep uh, thinking that this is a woman and not a man, we have no convincing identifications, in my opinion. Now, if you look carefully at the image we have on the left, there is something very interesting. Uh, the so-called red goddess, uh, who is actually a god, in my opinion, sitting on a dragon with an arrow in his hand, uh, 
with uh, uh, at least uh, the lower left hand, he's holding a piece of textile. And uh, this textile was completely covering him. Uh, Marcus Mode proposed uh, a very interesting uh, identification for this deity. He still considers uh, uh, this deity to be a woman, but according to some, um, to some uh, liturgies that are still uh, used in India, for example, holy statues were covered and shown to the people only on certain occasions. And this is something that uh, is probably represented here. The god uh, is coming out from some garments, some uh, curtain, I would say, with this uh, lattice uh, decoration. So at this point, uh, since in Penjikent, uh, we have uh, these uh, um, twin temples. Uh, and uh, uh, some scholars propose to um, attribute one of these temples to Nana. Well, Nana had a husband already in Mesopotamia, Nabu, who became Tishtria in Sogdiana. So maybe we could think about something like that. One temple for the woman, one temple for the men. Uh, we have uh, pretty often uh, this kind of uh, um, couples, divine couples uh, everywhere. In, uh, in the ancient world. The Zoroastrianism, which was uh, uh, very popular in Sogdiana before Islamic uh, and the conversion, before Islamic time, uh, was not uh, the Zoroastrianism uh, uh, that we have in India, for example, nowadays, or in Yazd in Iran. And it was not the Zoroastrianism we had in the Caucasus or in Iran uh, during the Sasanian period. We have to keep in mind this. Uh, it was a kind of uh, a pagan system. And uh, uh, in this image, uh, we have uh, Adbag, which is Aura Mazda, but Nana seems uh, to be more important. And I think that uh, uh, we have to keep in mind that Nana had a husband. So not only her, but also the divine couple formed probably a very important icon, at least uh, in Sogdiana during the pre-Islamic period. Now, next slide, please. Marcus Mode, uh, a great uh, scholar of Sogdian studies, uh, who enjoys very much in reconstructions, he's very good uh, in um, drawing, he proposed uh, to reconstruct uh, some other decorative elements that we have in the courtyard of Temple 2 in Penjikent. We have a very interesting frieze in stucco with uh, aquatic representation. There is a Makara, which is an Indian dragon. There are tritons uh, uh, from uh, the Greco-Roman tradition or even Etruscan, if you want. And then there is a statue, very fragmentary of a deity that uh, uh, Mode identified as a man. And this is very interesting, I think. This statue was standing on a pedestal which was embellished with another Makara. And very interesting, uh, the god had a, a plate in his hand with a fish above. And we know that the Sogdian deities very often in Penjikent paintings, for example, were represented with a plate in hand and very symbolic animal above. Now, uh, Marcus Mode proposed to identify this uh, god with uh, an aquatic deity. Probably, he said, uh, a representation of uh, uh, the Oxus River, the Amudaria, which is very important, and he became a deity already in, uh, in Kushan period, and even earlier, probably. Even uh, um, the historians of Alexander the Great uh, tell us a story about uh, uh, rivers which were considered by local people to be gods. However, if uh, we consider uh, what I show you before, 
I think that uh, even an ident identification of the god connected with Makara, which is a dragon, with a Tish, works pretty well. The only problem is the fish in the dish. So we said that uh, Tish in Sogdiana had some connections with a dragon, which is coming from Mesopotamia, and with a dog, which is uh, specifically Iranian. So what about the fish? Well, Tishtria in the Avesta is the rain god. So he is an aquatic deity. And moreover, uh, Shushanik, please, uh, uh, next slide. I would like to show you something again from uh, Afghanistan. So not exactly Bactria uh, region, but uh, a place very close uh, uh, to Bactria. We have an image of a deity sitting on a throne. It's very fragmentary, but if you look uh, in his right upper hand, he has an arrow with some ribbons attached. I don't know if you can see. Uh, unfortunately, I have just uh, this uh, sketch uh, that uh, Jonathan Lee um, kindly gave me. And very interesting, if you look uh, uh, below his uh, feet, uh, you can see a kind of pond uh, with some fishes. So at least uh, in this region, a deity with an arrow in his hand, who Franz Grenet, uh, in my opinion, rightly identified uh, with uh, uh, Tishtria, didn't have any dog, any dragon, but fishes. Because fishes are very appropriate uh, animals, symbols for a rain god. He is connected with water. Next uh, slide, please. Very recent uh, excavations uh, in... Um, in Kafir Kala, which is not far from Samarkand, a kind of capital of ancient Sogdiana, according to Chinese sources, gave as a result uh, the findings of this uh, um, burnt uh, wooden frieze with a representation of Nana. In this case, Nana is very clearly represented. She has uh, four hands, so very strong Indian elements. The moon and the sun are there. And uh, this is something interesting. With one hand, she's like, uh, you see, with uh, the lower left hand, uh, it seems like she is uh, uh, removing some textile, a kind of curtain, and coming out uh, like uh, the deity I propose to identify with Tishtria in the niche of room five in Temple Two in Penjikant. With uh, the lower right hand, uh, she's holding an attribute, probably a mace, uh, with the face of a, of a fish or dragon with a small uh, circular element in its mouth. And uh, this is something, uh, again, interesting, because it seems like uh, that uh, uh, in, in this couple, okay, man and woman, they have some attributes. And... Uh, this kind of uh, fish or dragon-like uh, mace uh, could uh, be a suggestion that this kind of attributes, maybe, but it's an hypothesis, were interchangeable, okay? Now, uh, of course, uh, I cannot uh, <laughs> connect all the elements because uh, it's a very complicated story. Anyway, uh, Nana in Mesopotamia, had a sister, and uh, her sister was uh, the queen of the underworld, and her symbolic animal was the fish. Anyway, that's another story from an, for another presentation, uh, maybe. Now, next uh, slide, uh, please. Here we have something very interesting, but uh, I cannot say anything 100%, because it's a unique golden coin, second century from the Kushan period. And, uh, you know, in Kushan uh, coinage, we have something very interesting. On one side, we have the face of a king. On the other side, we have a representation of a deity. And in this case, we have uh, the name, uh, it's probably written Teiro in Bactrian. Teiro, Bactrian, Avestan, Tishtria, 
Sogdi and Tish, most likely we have a representation of Tishtria here, okay? The star Sirius or planet Mercury, the god of rain of Iranian people. But it's unique. So it's very difficult to make a parallel or <laughs> it's very difficult for me at least to be convincing. And what is very interesting is that uh, um, definitely he is an archer and he is uh, taking an arrow from the kiver on his back. But if you look carefully of, at the garment and if you look carefully at the iconography, this is Artemis from Greek art, because we know cushions took a lot of uh, elements from uh, uh, the Greek uh, cu the cultural milieu after the invasion by Alexander. And this is something which uh, uh, called uh, my curiosity, because uh, if uh, scholars like Belenitsky, Marshak, Raspopova, Grenet, Schenker, Lurie, they were all convinced that uh, the two deities I showed you before, the so-called white goddess and the so-called red goddess were women, it's because probably in ancient Central Asia, they always represented this god as a woman. He was a kind of transvestite uh, god for some reason that we don't really understand. But this is what we have, unfortunately, I can base uh, my observations on this unique coin, which uh, I admit uh, it's very little evidence. But if we put together all the pieces slowly, slowly, I will take you to my conclusion. So next slide, please. We have some uh, um, metal dishes with representation of a woman sitting on a dragon with these uh, curly horns. Like in this case, this is a, a, a silver plate uh, in, um, in France now. It was not excavated, unfortunately. Unepigraphic, so we don't have any sure identification. Next slide, please. We have uh, another woman. And this uh, is uh, in the Hermitage Museum. Uh, next slide, please. Anyway, it's another uh, silver dish, possibly from Iran, with uh, a woman uh, playing a long uh, uh, instrument, a music instrument, sitting on a dragon, which is very similar to this one. Because as I was telling you, the curly horns are something uh, probably connected with uh, the symbolic animal of Nabu, in uh, Mesopotamian art. Uh, Shushanik, please, uh, uh, can, you, um, can you put the next slide? Oh, this one. So in these uh, two cases, uh, uh, they really look like women. The one before was even naked. So it's very difficult for me to identify this uh, uh, deity as a man dressed like a woman. But in the next slide, Next slide, please. We have some uh, Horasmian metalwork. And in this metalwork, we have very often Nana. And uh, um, we thought that there was no Tishtria, but uh, if my ideas are correct, next slide, please. I can show you a better image. You see, we have the dragon with uh, this curly horn and uh, a deity who has been identified as a woman, but actually could be a man dressed as a woman. Can you see in the left hand, uh, there is uh, again uh, a, a, an object which could be an arrow. Next, uh, next slide, please. So in, in Sogdian art, uh, sometimes uh, we have uh, uh, the divine couple, man and woman, sitting on their symbolic animals and with a plate, again, repeating the symbolic animal in one hand. This is something we have quite often 
In this case, it's a reconstruction because the painting was very fragmentary. And this is just an example in order to illustrate uh, what uh, is coming next. Shushanik uh, Jan, please, next uh, slide. Here we are. This is uh, a paper fragment found in Tunghuang, which is in China, okay? And it's a, a Buddhist center. And uh, scholars could not decide which identification to give to these uh, deities because they are 100% women. Why? Because uh, the headdress, jewels, and garments are uh, elements of women. But we already know that uh, uh, Tishtria was probably represented as a woman already in Central Asia, at least since the second century CE. So the goddess on the right with four hands and the sun and the moon in the upper hands is probably Nana. She is sitting on the lion, but uh, whoever did this lion represented in a, in a way which looks like a, a wolf, but in my opinion is a lion. So this is Nana, woman, 100%, four hands. She's represented according to Indian style, which was adopted in this part of China, which was controlled by Uyghur Turks who were Buddhist. And they used their own elements. So very strong Chinese, Uyghur, Indian, you see. What about the deity on the left? I think he is Tishtria. He is a man dressed like a woman. Unfortunately, he is not sitting on the animal, but he has a plate with his symbolic animal, the dog. Okay, if we put together all the elements, we find the logic of this kind of representation. And uh, I have almost concluded. Next slide, uh, please, uh, Sushanik, sorry. <laughs> In this uh, Islamic book illustration, we see the sun, you see the symbolic sun with text identifying him 100%. It's Persian, so we can read. This is a representation of the sun sitting on the lion, but look at the lion. He is represented like a wolf, very similar to the wolf we have in the paper fragment from Tunghuang. Again, we are not exactly in the same period, but uh, we have some hints and we have to put together everything in order to give uh, some convincing reading to what we have. Next uh, slide, please. We have uh, uh, some other very interesting results. And this is my last uh, slide. I hope uh, I didn't uh, exceed uh, too much. But uh, here is what we have. We are in a Buddhist environment, okay? And we have uh, uh, Buddha uh, together with uh, the personifications of the planets. And uh, Chinese used another astronomical, astrological system, okay? Chinese zodiac is different, but they adopted the Western, the Western system, probably from Sasanian Iran through India or through Sogdiana. And Antonio Panayino, one of the most prominent scholars in this field of studies, uh, already proposed that probably there was a Sogdian intermediary between uh, ancient astrology and uh, uh, the Chinese who adopted it. And I think that Panaino was 100% uh, correct. And in this painting, we have the evidence because Mercury, Nabu in Mesopotamia, Tishtria in the Iranian world, Tish in Sogdiana, is represented as a woman. And uh, the garment is definitely a woman, the face, uh, the, the, the makeup. And uh, this woman is holding a stylus, a, a pen, let's say, something to write, and a book. Okay, he is a scribe. And he has a monkey on his uh, crown. The monkey is an Egyptian element, is coming from Thoth. 
the Egyptian god of scribes, whose animal was the baboon. And everything is here in China in the ninth century. And uh, uh, the name of Mercury in Chinese is, is uh, Shui Xing, which uh, literally means uh, the water planet. Why water? Scholars of Chinese astrology could not understand why he is connected with water, why he is, why he is a woman. Okay, okay, the five planets and the five Chinese elements, but why Mercury water? <laughs> because in Sogdian uh, culture, he was Tishtria, the god of rain, an aquatic deity. And why a woman? Well, we cannot answer this. But uh, if uh, we imagine a Sogdian intermediary, we have this result. But in this case, we have to think that the unique cushion coin we uh, supposedly represented the Teiro is probably correct. And then going back, <laughs> moving in space and time, we have to admit that most likely the white goddess and the red goddess in Penjikent were not women at all, but were men. And they represented most likely the husband of Nana. And uh, I have concluded, uh, sorry if I use uh, too much time. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Matteo. Thank you for your very interesting insight into all these uh, details and peculiarities of the depictions of these three and relevant deities. I wonder if there are questions to our lecturers. Please, uh, colleagues. Yes, uh, please, uh, Phil. We cannot hear you properly. I cannot hear. My my question is, what got? You Please make it louder. It's very hard to hear. Yeah. My question is, what got you interested in this subject? It's a very interesting subject, and I would like to know the genesis of what got you interested in it. Why did you decide to research this specific area? It's a very interesting area, and I'd like to know. <laughs> the reasons behind why you chose this it, it, it's a, a very simple question with a very complicated uh, <laughs> attachments actually um i started as a sinologist and uh, i started to study the sogdians in china so iran eastern iranian people and going back uh, I started with Sasanians because I realized that every time scholars are in troubles and cannot really um, identify properly some iconographies, especially in, in the Chinese uh, uh, world, which is very big actually, including uh, the Western regions where Sogdians lived in big number, they were just saying, oh, that's Sasanian stuff. <laughs> But if you go back and you analyze what we know about the Sasanian art, you see that we know nothing, almost nothing. We have more information about uh, uh, Zoroastrianism in the Caucasus or even in, uh, in Komagene, so in the Western world, and what we had in Central Asia. But the Persia is a big gap. So that moved me and uh, I started to, to find some other answers, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Lilith uh, wants to ask something. Hello, Mr. Camparetti. Yes, are you listening? <laughs> are you listening to me? Yeah, 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 I can hear you. Oh, yes, it's okay. I would like to ask you, we know uh, well that in Avesta we have this Tishtria Yasht, 
And in this Yasht in Avesta, we have that uh, the personification of Tishtria was a white horse or uh, that a beautiful horse. And uh, yeah. of course, connected with rain, etc. And uh, this horse uh, is fighting against the black horse. Uh, this uh, something like this. Yes, yes. And uh, what you think? Uh, think why there is no images of horse and the Sogdian art uh, connected with Tishtria images? Uh, what mm. do you think about this information? Because. Uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we don't see uh, any image of a uh, horse uh, like animals in, yes. uh, connected with Tishtria. Thank you. Yeah, um, actually, uh, we don't uh, have uh, just uh, the, how we can say, avatar of mm -hmm. Tishtria as uh, a horse with golden ears, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, golden ears. And uh, um, when we have a description of Tishtria in Avesta, but uh, uh, Miguel Angel uh, knows better. Um, he is described uh, as a warrior on a chariot with horses. So again, the horse is very important. And the horse in, uh, in ancient uh, Indo-European, let's say, allow mm -hmm. me to use this horrible term, uh, tradition, the horse was always an aquatic element. Uh, the mm -hmm. horse was the animal of Poseidon for the Greeks. Yes, of course. Poseidon was a horse. In Italian, we even say when we have big uh, waves, uh, we call big horses. We say cavalloni. Yes. Yes. And this is probably something we inherited from uh, our uh, Greco-Latin background. Mm -hmm. However, as you see, we have different animals and we have a stratification which is Mesopotamian, Iranian, yes, we have yes. uh, Indian elements, we have Turkish elements, we have Chinese elements. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, when we have Indo-Europeans things, sometimes they, uh, they are okay, each other, okay? But when mm -hmm. we have uh, cultures which are not Indo-European, we have other elements. Mm -hmm. Just the Mesopotamian are, one is very chaotic. So mm -hmm. I think the Sogdians, the Sogdians were pretty um, order mm -hmm. when they decided that one symbolic animal they use only for that deity. So, for example, Nana had the lion, mm -hmm. okay, yes. but the lion was also the animal of uh, um, of Ishtar in Mesopotamia, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Ishtar was practically Aphrodite for the Greeks and was Anahita for Iranians. We don't have Anahita in Central Asia before the third century, but when the Sasanians conquered Bactria, probably mm -hmm. they introduced Anahita because we have uh, on Kushano Sasanian coins with uh, written Anahita the Lady. Mm -hmm. Okay? But. Uh, yeah. In my opinion, when the Sogdians represented Anahita, they use the ram, the goat, not mm -hmm. the lion, because yeah. uh, uh, the lion was already taken by Nana. Mm -hmm. Not many people probably could read in those days. And we had the same in Italian churches in the Middle Ages. People cannot read, but they recognize the images. Mm -hmm. Biblia pauperum was called in Latin. They don't read, but they identify. If you have two women with lion, who is Nana and who is Anahita? So I think when they took the horse, they already attributed to Mithra. Mm. Sometimes he is represented with a horse. And yes. They decided sometimes to keep the dragon, sometimes to mix with a dog or to add the dog or the fish. They try to make some other adaptation in order not to disturb other iconography. But of course, this is just my idea because we don't mm -hmm. have much evidence. But your point mm -hmm. is absolutely correct. You see, when we use Avesta yes. and we focus too much on Avesta, with the study of religions, 
which do not match exactly with yes, Avestan yes, yes. teaching, we make a, a very big chaos because yes, we, yes, cannot, uh, we cannot attribute to deities what we expect in our mind. We have to mm -hmm. accept what uh, they did and study for what it is. I think yes, this yes. is more honest. <laughs> yes. Otherwise, we have big, big troubles uh, with identification. Yes, if if I'm not mistaken, we don't have any image of Tishtria in Sasanian art. Uh, just uh, correct Sasanian uh, as a horse uh, in, in general, as uh, any animal, uh, I think. And I know you very know, well that uh, there's information in Avesta, and in, uh, the images of art is not uh, connected uh, always. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, I think you are right. Uh, you know, we have a big uh, repertoire of uh, images uh, in Sasanian art, uh, which is coming only from uh, seals and seal impressions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what we have in official art uh, is uh, very little. Yes. When we do have Aura Mazda mm -hmm. in uh, Naqshirustam, for example, in um, not far from uh, Bizutun in Iran, yes. mm -hmm. Aura Mazda is uh, sitting on a horse. He's riding a horse. Yes. And yes. we are 100% sure is Aura Mazda because it's written it's in Middle Persian, Parthian, and Greek. But he's called the Zeus. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the Zeus would have been uh, reproduced with an eagle from uh, my uh, Greco Latin point of view. But yes. in Iran, he was with a horse. Mm -hmm. So you see, we cannot uh, respect uh, the Avesta. I mean, when it uh, it matches is okay yes. when it doesn't yes. match we have to say okay yes. they they pro they propose something different otherwise yes. we force uh, and it doesn't work thank you very much thank you for the lecture interesting <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from zari hakopian who has problems with yes. sounds and cannot uh, uh, and shall I read uh, her question because she she left it in the chat chat. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm writing my greetings and thank you for a very interesting presentation. I'm sorry thank I you. have problems with sound. Just one remark. I concern with the uh, Gregory, who you mentioned. No, no, I cannot. I cannot hear you. No sorry. arguments for pre question no. dating. I want to warn you. No, I cannot hear you. I cannot hear you. Yes. Okay. Grigorian, whom you mentioned, unfortunately, brought no arguments for pre-Christian dating. Uh, and I want to warn you about such conclusions. The Christian and biblical okay. scenes prevail on this stella. So even if there are one or two pre-Christian symbols, we could speak only about the reuse of that very symbols in early Christian time. I think it's rather okay. a complicated yeah. question, but you can also yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Thank you. Say uh, to Zaruhi, thank you very much. Uh, I will keep in mind this uh, in future. Yes. Uh, any other questions, colleagues? I yeah, think Ali like Sher uh, is yeah, asking yeah. something. Well, thank you very much, Matteo, um, for your insightful talk. It was very interesting. Um, I was wondering if uh, what you mentioned about Tishtria to be identified, uh, to be merged with um, Greek Apollo. Um, and we know that Greek Apollo is also merged with um, Mithra. Yes. So um, I was wondering what connection um, between the two, maybe. Uh, do you have any idea? Well, um the very clear connection between uh, Mithra, Apollo, Hermes, uh, we have in uh, Nemrudag in, um, in Comagene. In the, how, how is called, uh, Shamash. Heron. Shamash? Uh, there is a, no, I don't think there is a Shamash. You know, in uh, what is uh, nowadays, uh, uh, southeastern Turkey, we have uh, a funerary monument of Antiochus, uh, the first uh, oh, okay. king of Comagene. This, uh, the kings of this region, they were Anatolian people, 
with very strong Iranian and Greek uh, Hellenistic connections. They, they reproduce uh, these uh, statues of deities uh, with uh, Greek names. Uh, for example, we have uh, Zeus or Mazdes. We have uh, Heracles, uh, Verethragna, <laughs> uh, Ares, uh, something like that. And uh, definitely uh, Apollo is connected with Mithra and Hermes. There is no uh, mention of Tishtria, but uh, his name could be very appropriate uh, in that uh, group. No. So we... definitely they connected uh, uh, Mithra with Apollo. No. I was wondering if there might be some connection between Tishtria and Mithra because they are uh, getting closer because of their um some functions uh within art and uh, as well as uh, with textual um, um evidence we have mithra um in subjana he appears as a contract god um, yeah. so as some sort of uh, god related to scribe uh, writing um if so this is my um some uh, very basic idea, I, you know, yet. I think it's a, that's a very good point. Yeah. Uh, actually, it came to my mind, uh, listening to your um, observations, uh, uh, the slide I show you from Penjikent, the burnt uh, wooden frieze, uh, which is in the Hermitage now. Actually, we have arches and deities uh, under mm -hmm. the arches. And the uh, Mithra on chariot, uh, quite clearly represented is next to the deity I propose to identify with Tishtria. So maybe there was some association actually, but uh, it just came to my mind right now after uh, your ideas. Good. I will uh, check more in texts. Yeah, it's um, a good I, I've been also uh, very much curious about these um, areas and I've, I've been um, collecting some materials about the Mithra and some related gods. And I would like to share it with you and discuss it with you later. I have some yeah. observations and I believe, uh, well, I'm not sure that the red deity that you call Tishra um, uh, may be still as it, to me, uh, still yeah. a goddess. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I have uh, some, idea, but I'm not sure. I will, I will um, soon um, maybe contact you and discuss with you. And one more you know, thing I would like to um, share with, uh, with you that we have a um, Sogjian tax, a Christian Sogjian tax, where we know mm -hmm. um, instead of Apollo, the Sogjians wrote Mahakala. Mm -hmm. So, um, a manifestation of Shiva. So maybe yes. there's something, also something related uh, going on between India and um, Central Asia, but um, it's again, a very <laughs> difficult. Uh, well, like, that, that's, that's making everything more complicated. Yeah, one more thing that is complicated, that Makara you mentioned of the red deity, is yeah. um, also um, an animal um, of Varuna. It's an animal of Varuna, but uh, it's also the animal uh, of... Uh, Ganga. Uh, it's the animal of a river goddess Ganga. in India. <laughs> so it's very complicated. It's very interesting, but um, there's still... Um, I hope uh, you'll find more so maybe we will find something more um, in the near future. Let me know because I know you have very interesting uh, seals from Kafirkala. Yeah, we do not have maybe Tisha. I, I did not see yet, but maybe you'll find soon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we cannot hear you, Victoria. You have to switch on the microphone. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Uh, more <laughs> questions, uh, colleagues. Anybody else who would like to ask anything? Um, if uh, there is no more questions, how will you think, Pavel? Hello, Pavel, please. Hello, can you see me? Sure. Yeah. Talk, Pavel. 
Indeed. So, Mateo, thank you very much for the very uh, interesting and uh, rich presentation. I think this way it will get uh, better. So it is a very immense in material and very much, very much filled for uh, uh, food for thinking. My question is following. So in Middle Persian, everything is tear, and in New Persian as well. So for uh, Mercury, yes. it pronounced tear. For uh, Sirius, it is or Sirius God, whatever is pronounced tear. Uh, for the day name, it's tear. For the arrow or arrowhead, it is tear. But in old Iranian and in some Middle Iranian, including Sogdian, there were different terms. So for in Avestan, we know very well that uh, Sirius is Tishtriya, while Mercury maybe appears in one personal name, Tiro Nakasva, and he's Tira there. And uh, in old Iranian, the arrowhead is just something sharp. It is Tigra. So it's a different mm. thing. And in Sogden as well, they would be pronounced differently. So we have the names based on Tir, and we have names mm. based on Tish, which is uh. Tishria. How much do you think is it possible to put them all together, to think that in something before the Sasana and Iran, it was a merger of the gods for uh, Tir, for, for Sirius and for Mercury and uh, of uh, the um, uh, arrow as well. Thank you. You know, um, actually, that's a very good point. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the linguist uh, is uh, <laughs> you. <laughs> you are the authority in this field. But uh, I read uh, practically everything uh, Antonio uh, Panaino wrote uh, on this point. Not uh, just uh, from the linguistic point of view, but uh, from uh, the um, religious or cultural point of view. And uh, there is actually a very big problem about this identification that I propose. Uh, I'm perfectly aware because uh, uh, we know from Middle Persian texts that uh, the planets were evil creatures, okay? While yeah. other um, luminaries were considered to be positive. And, uh, um, you know, I didn't arrive to that point, uh, but, uh, you know, if, uh, as I suspect, uh, a good uh, key of mm -hmm. lecture of these identifications in Sogdian art is astrology, we are forced to consider these creatures, these entities, the planets, which are negative, to be somehow uh, reconducted to a good nature, because we have evidence that the Sogdians um, respected somehow the planets, when the Chinese speak about uh, the names of the weak, uh, they try to, to give uh, in Chinese the name of uh, uh, deities, which are planetary deities, like for example, uh, Najie, Nasie in Chinese is Nahid, okay, which is Venus. Yes, yes. So we, we do have definitely a lot of hints uh, about this, uh, but uh, how can we put together all this? Uh, and now you even ar arouse uh, a new problem, which is uh, uh, names. Maybe it could be connected to this uh, double nature, maybe even double names, even etymology at a popular level. Maybe in ancient times they could have put it together you know, even Herodotus uh, is uh, telling us a lot of rubbish <laughs> about uh, reconstructions of words uh, that he tr he listen and he try to reconstruct according to Greek uh, language, <laughs> and of course these are uh, not real according to modern linguistics. So I think uh, again it's very good uh, he to have here linguists art historian, archaeologist, in order to put everything together. Of course, it's still very foggy, very vague, but slowly, slowly, especially thanks to the work of archaeologists, we are probably going in the right direction.
but that's only my idea. I would say my feeling, not really <laughs> my solution. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Victoria, your um, microphone. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Uh, thank you, Pavel and Matteo. Anybody else would like to ask? Uh, yes, please, Miguel. Switch on your microphone, please. We cannot hear you. Now it's okay. Matteo, for your talk, that was wonderful. Ah. You have such a small point related to the to the identification, apart from popular etymology, from folk etymology of ir and arrow in mm. Middle Persian, in Pahlavi, that would be very easy because they are written exactly the same. <laughs> so it's ah, okay. almost impossible unless you have a context to distinguish the writing mm. of ir and tigr because mm. both are written e g L or T Y L, Y and okay. G are written exactly the same in Pahlavi. So even not mm -hmm. only from a folk etymology, but also from a written point of view, it would be very easy for a speaker, at least of Middle Persian, other but in Middle Persian, it would be very easy to identify T with an arrow mm -hmm. because they are from a graphical point exactly the same, apart from the point of view that popular or folk etymology might also help just mm. to support Wonderful. this view. <laughs> Thank you very much. I to think uh, even in Armenian, uh, it's a tear. No, we have in mm. Armenian sources a tear, uh, Mercury, the planet. Uh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? More questions? Well, if not, uh, I would like to once more say thank you, Matteo, very much for your very interesting talk, uh, which has uh, brought you. so much uh, such an active discussion. Uh, and uh, thank you, Shushan, for your constant technical support, and I would say even spiritual thank support. You. <laughs> I'm very sorry for this <laughs> problem. Uh... It's okay. And I dare remind you that that was one of the lectures in the series dedicated to the 25th anniversary of Iran and the Caucasus. And we continue the series through the whole year. Please join us, follow our announcements on the Facebook page of the uh, Iran and the Caucasus or Russian uh, Armenian University Institute of Oriental Studies. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Philip Hopkins, who will um, uh, tell us about um, um, uh, the transitioning model of American Christianity in Iran during the last years of the Pahlavis. Uh, after that, we will have lectures by uh, James Russell, Antonio Panaina, and many other outstanding scholars. So please follow us and stay tuned for the whole series. Thank you very much, uh, Matteo. Thank you once more. Thank really you. grateful for your participation. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Thank you.